Yo, what's going on Epic 7? I'm Sue, and in this video, we're going to be discussing the October 24th balance adjustment preview that was just shown earlier this morning over on Stowe. Honestly, kind of blindsided by this one. Wasn't really expecting to see this one show up so soon. Uh, normally, balance patches take like eight weeks or so. Uh, this one's pretty quick turnaround. I think it's like six weeks, right, overall. And normally, these balance patches only contain eight heroes. This one contains 16. So devs are actually listening. They are out here making the changes that we want to see. They want to, we asked for faster balance patches. We want like shorter turnaround time and we want more things in it. Cool. They did it. Since this balance patch is so long, I'm going to very quickly try to give you my thoughts at the start. We're going to do the format a little bit differently. Before, I would kind of give you the list of things and tell you what we need in order to see if the character is like better or worse with the changes. But because we're going to be literally talking about 21 entries in this, if I spend more than like two minutes per character, this video is going to be an hour long. So we're going to be talking about Ruel of Light, Silverblade Armenta, Last Rider Crow, Commander Pavel, Designer Lilibet, Twisted Eye Lankara, Melissa, Says, Elena, Mort, Yulha, Blooming Lydica, Augslots, Peacemaker Furious, Veronica, Armin, and for the artifacts, Cruel Mischief, Rihanna and Luciella, Pure White Trust, Hostess of the Banquet. And then there is a system change to how extra turns work, similar to how they kind of change like Restrict and how it works uh, like a year and something ago. So all that in this balance patch. Let's just jump into it, starting with Ruel. Ruel is probably my favorite Soul Weaver in the game. She doesn't really have a niche in the current meta. Her biggest weakness is against AoE damage dealers. She needs some form of AoE healing to keep up with other Soul Weavers that are currently in Epic 7. Key to an Oath now has Desert Jewel Basara's basic attack skill. It is an AoE skill, right? An AoE healing skill, which is perfect. That's exactly what Ruel needed. She needs a way to kind of keep up with all the AoE damage in the game. Giving her that Desert Jewel Basara S1 is massive. It might not seem like it because Desert Jewel Basara, the biggest problem with him is that his stats suck, right? That's half the reason that I think he's not meta. He has a great kit which is absolutely god-awful stats. He dies way too easily. Ruel of Light has Blood Moon Haze stats. So, much better stat line to have that skill on. So, this is goes a very long way, I think, towards making this character very, very good. Next up, Light Pillar. Now gains not only the full debuff uh, cleanse, the barrier, the full heal, but also places damage limit. On the character for two turns in case you forgot damage limit is the buff that midnight galilius has which means that they can't take more than 33 percent of their health in a single hit you have to basically three tap them but if you ever played against midnight galilius on bastion of Prelucia, you know that that character is impossible to kill when she has a barrier on her because it takes like four or five hits not three so having a skill that puts a barrier and damage limit on one character basically is Ruel's way of saying, try and kill it. I dare you. It's going to be really difficult to do that. And then obviously the solution to all that would be, well, I'll just kill Ruel of Light in one hit with like my Midnight Galililius or, you know, my Architect Laika or whatever have you, right? Like your choice of just one-shotting somebody. Well, this character has uh, Spirit's Lord's protection at the start of the first battle. And yeah, that says upon receiving lethal damage, revives Ruel with 50% health and increases her combat radius by 50%. Which basically is most likely going to give Ruel a turn if she hasn't already taken one at the start of a fight. So if you kill the Ruel at the start of a fight, she just revives, takes a turn. And yeah, she'll be at half health, but cool. She could just light pillar herself, full heal back up, give herself a barrier and damage limit and goes, okay, five hits to kill me. More if I'm on water's origin. Good luck. So yeah, this is a really good change for Ruel of Light. And I'm pretty stoked. Again, this is my favorite Soul Weaver. And I will definitely be using her, I think, in the uh, upcoming season. This has like, always been my favorite Soul Weaver. And I love playing her. So even if I don't think she might necessarily be the best with these changes, even if she's OP with these changes, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be playing Ruel because she finally has one of her weaknesses addressed. And she feels like she has a real niche to fill. 
Next up, we have Silverblade Araminta, another ML that is near and dear to my heart. She is the girl that ruined Epic 7. So for those of you who haven't watched my History of Epic 7 series, uh, you could go and watch the girl that ruined uh, Epic 7, Silverblade Araminta. We talked about her at length in that video. Um, I don't really need to rehash it. I'll link it down in this video's description. But basically, since they nerfed this character in the fall of 2019, she's been super inconsistent, right? And every time she's here on the patch, I get a little bit excited because I, I kind of want her to function like how she does in draft mode. Uh, a couple, you know, patches back. I don't think it's the same now. They had this really insane Silverblade Armento where she had like 3,000 attack, 200 effectiveness, 260 speed, and also like 1,600 defense and like 16k HP. That's not something you can realistically build on your Silverblade Armenta. Um, but some of the changes that we have here for Silverblade are very good, right? So now, instead of getting 25% CR on Flame Release, which if you don't know, she basically uses Flame Friction and goes and then snaps and then burns somebody. And then you get Flame Release, which is a AoE follow-up attack with more burns on the enemy team. And then she gets a small CR push. So now you get the snap, the burn, the release, the extra burn, and then all of the burns detonate. So you get to cash in all of your damage up front, which is super sweet. They also change the passive Flame of Savra. Before, whenever you use an AoE attack, she would get a one-time combat readiness push of 20%, which would hopefully help you set up the Meteor Fall, which is her big S3, her big, you know, tide-turning ultimate skill. Now, it says at the start of the first battle, increases attack proportional to effectus, the rate of attack effect does not change after is activated. So this is similar to Red Robbie. So before, you would go speed boots, and then attack percentage ring, and then health percentage as your necklace if you wanted to deal damage on burns. But then you had no effective, so then you couldn't actually land the burns. So then you had to go, okay, I will go effectiveness ring and attack percentage as my necklace. Okay, cool. Now your burns do real damage. Now you have effectiveness, but the character dies in one hit. With this change, I can comfortably go speed boots, effectiveness ring without losing any damage, and then also health percentage necklace. That fixes a massive issue with the character and allows her to be much tankier and much more usable. When an ally except for the caster has their turn ends, increases the combat rate of the caster by 15%. This is amazing because just overall the passive, right? Now you can tune a team where even if you have a slower, like higher F, harder hitting Araminta, if three of your teammates go beforehand and you have it sequenced up correctly in like a cleave, then Araminta can bring up the rear, drop the rock with Meteor Fall, stun everybody, awesome, and then you can kind of continue on with your cleave or your control. But Flame of Sabra is also an amazing passive because one of the things that I used to love to do back in the day was put this character on counter set because Flame Friction and Flame Release, like those can proc off turn, right? You can counter with Silver Blade, go Flame Friction, get the burn, Flame Release, and then you get the CR push and then that was really, really good. You'll get the detonate now, that's fine. But the fact that you can now build this character way tankier, because of the change to effectiveness converting to attack, that's really good. Having the 15% CR push whenever an ally's turn except the caster ends, that's also good for helping her turn cycling. So again, you could potentially go something like health percentage boots, health percentage necklace, effectiveness ring, right? And have some, you know, decent speed, like 200 speed, be a very tanky Araminta, right? That, that might be a thing that you can do because of this passive. So I'm, I'm excited about the build path possibilities. And we didn't even talk about the fact that Meteor Fall just gets extra damage, right? Uh, it looks like, and it looks like they just changed the Mulligoras, but they lowered the, the, the cooldown on Meteor Fall. I think they put this back to how it used to be when she was released in 2019. Doesn't have the three burns like she did at, at launch, but hey, it's 100% burn now instead of, uh, what is this, 75% burn, right? 65 to 75 based on the skill chance. So overall though, great changes to Araminta as well. I'm excited to play this character post changes as well here. Next up, we have Last Rider Crow. Basically, Death Deal Array and Urban Shadow Shoe just removed this character from the meta. He's like absolutely terrible versus those characters. Um, I think just he needs something that can deal with them. And I don't think these changes really help him here. Uh, he just needs to have some kind of inherent value. I feel like also over the other OP tanks that see play right now, like your Albedos or your Ambitious Tywins. So, code number 00 now gives a two-turn barrier, as opposed to one turn. 
that's fine. Doesn't really, you know, revolutionize everything. But this change to Mobile Weapon Siegfried here is pretty good. Whenever you use Mobile Weapon Siegfried, it decreases the school cooldowns of all allies, including Kral by one turn, which is why the cooldown of Mobile Weapon Siegfried is eight turns, because obviously when you use it, it'll go down by one turn. So it functions the same in terms of cooldown duration, right? It hasn't really changed. So yeah, this is pretty good. Um, I think that this change makes it so that Kral must be on immunity. Before, players would have realized that Nequal, right, can't really reset Last Rider Crowd because you push his cooldowns back, but then it procs code number double O and pushes his cooldowns forward. So, therefore, you could never truly stop Crowl with uh, Nequal unless you sealed him first and then came back around and went for your S3. If you have a Crowl on immunity at the start, he can't be sealed by Nequal, and there's just no way that you can actually stop him. So this is actually a pretty good change. It gives him a very oddly specific niche. It doesn't make him like supremely meta. But now turn two players have another alternative to combat Laia besides uh, Moon Bunny, Dominion, besides Laia, right? You have Laia and Moon Bunny like you always did. And usually Nequal players would try to take one of them, right? And then put you in a situation where they would ban the other. Well, now you could go, oh, they took Moon Bunny. I could take Laia and Last Rider, right? They can't really get rid of it and I can use my ban protection on something that might be uh, more important to the match. I don't have to waste my counter pick on the ban protection, right? So good set of changes I feel like also for Last Rider Crow here. Commander Pobble just got a damage increase to Soulburn. He didn't really need any changes, but hey, this one's actually a pretty good one because I would play against Cleavers, they'd Soulburn Commander Pobble's S3 and I'd be like, Okay, that doesn't do anything. The match is already over. It doesn't increase the damage. Why are you wasting souls? Uh, so now, hey, the soul burn actually matches how the player base actually uses him. So, good change. Designer Lilibet is up next. Um, this character obviously has been suffering when compared to other cleansers. She's not as consistent as some of the other cleansers unless your opponent is just full on on the control debuff plan. Um, C Phantom Polidus obviously hoses her a bit as well. The big thing that I always wished that I could get was uh, essentially an uncounterable S3. I think that would have been super, super good to have. Just because even since the character came out, you press model disqualification, it procs three Elbruses and AOLs S2, and she gets skill nullifiers. Like, that's always felt bad, and I've always wished Designer a little bit had that. Sadly, didn't get that. What she did get here, though, is a defense break in place of her silence and her soul burn now gives it a two turn defense break right as well as the usual 100% uh, effect chance on it cool that's a good change helps increase her damage gives her better solo carry potential which happens a lot surprisingly when you're with designer a little bit like she's kind of left stranded alone at the end doesn't have enough damage to finish the job i will say though we are starting to oversaturate the game with defense breaks i need the design team to be aware of this we need to either start coming up with solutions to defense break kind of like dragon king sharoon is for like sleep and stun or you need to start drastically cutting back on them because we're getting to the point where it feels like every unique debuff is being replaced by defense break because it's like you guys are aware that it's the one that sells the one that is going to make the most people happy it's the one that's going to help people out the most defense break might be just a little overtuned just just pointing that out there i mean it was originally balanced around the old defense buff which you guys nerfed and you never nerfed the defense break so yeah just pointing that out next up change to emergency stitching gives immunity now this is great because what people would do originally is they would debuff your team proc emergency stitching then sleep or stun the designer Lilibet right before her turn so that she couldn't model disqualification and get everybody out of all of the debuffs. So that is a really good change uh, in my opinion. And then finally here for model disqualification, the 15% combat readiness in, uh, push now affects designer Lilibet herself and the base damage is increased and also it penetrates the target's defense by 50%. Cool, we're in Illinav meta, so uh, defense penetration is not as insane, but overall, these are good changes, I think, for Designer Lilibet. Will she see more play? Probably. Still will have issues with C Phantom Polis, but hey, good damage changes overall, good consistency changes overall. Next up is Twisted Idol on Kron. Um, this character, 
Scorpio Thief. I have historically always ripped on any Thief with the Scorpio stat line because it just has the worst defense pretty much of any 5-star in Epic 7. It's so bad that flat defense is better than defense percentage on this stat line. And as a result, nearly every character that is a Scorpio Thief has been historically bad unless they got some astronomically busted buff that made it so that it was super difficult to actually kill the character. So, what do we get here on Twisted Idol on Kron? Now his AoE counter does more damage. He gets a barrier on the single target S1. Also, when he finally has full fighting spirit from his passive Wandering Eidolon, he gets 100% combat radius push. Sword of Requiem, now instead of doing 2,000 fixed damage as the floor and 10,000 as the max, it does 5,000 fixed damage to the entire enemy team and 15k fixed damage as the maximum. So essentially, you get an extra 20,000 damage to the entire enemy team with Sword of Requiem. These are great damage increases, right? Great consistency increases in the spots where he's actually good because you can end games quicker with higher damage, higher fixed damage, right? The character still is going to struggle, I feel like, with the amount of stats that he needs. It's too difficult to build the character. That was not addressed in any of these changes. Character still has garbage defense, so he dies in like one hit for certain characters. That is also not addressed here, I feel like, in these changes. So, if you're an Eidolon... Kron player, please let me know how you feel about these things. I'm very, very curious. Do you play like less damage to go for more bulk because, you know, to compensate, you have higher base damage on the S1, higher fixed damage. Do we build more bulk and just forego a lot of the damage in the first place and just lean into sort of Requiem that way? Like, how do we build this character? Please let me know down in the comment section below. Next up is Melissa. Melissa simply just had the conditional damage dealt from manifestation removed and just given to her up front you will always have it her exclusive equipment option number three now gives an attack buff on blood bloom so now essentially the pattern for how you play the character will be to you know soul burn uh blood bloom get the attack buff cool take my extra turn get full damage on manifestation from full health Hopefully that's enough for her to be usable and to start bursting characters. If you are a Melissa player, because I am not, please let me know if I'm wrong. Please let me know if these changes are good for you down in the comments below. Moving on, we have Sez. Sez, just like Eilon Kron, this character suffers from the LOL Scorpio Thief. Right? Just absolutely garbage defense. And as you can see, on the left here on the red text, Die Hard, right? This was the change that was given to Sez to help offset his absolutely terrible defense. After being attacked, grant stealth for one turn. Stealth can only be activated once per turn. So, what we did here is we increased the damage dealt on Dark Shadow to help proc Encroach, which they moved Encroach off of Dark Shadow and moved it onto Die Hard. So it's now part of his passive again. It used to be originally part of his passive, not part of the S1. Right? So, yeah. We just basically upped the damage on S1 and moved Encroach to Die Hard. But to move Encroach to Die Hard, we had to give up stealth. Any ally now, when they attack, if a target's health is 30% or less, gets to use Encroach. Encroach can only be activated once every three turns. And then Encroach uh, increases, is an AoE attack, and it increases the combat readiness of Sez by 30%. And as always, damage dealt it increases proportional to target's lost health. So... That damage dealt increases to proportional to target's lost health needs to be massive because the only way you are going to have someone's health be 30% or less, right? The only way that that's going to happen is if they fail to kill something. It's pretty easy to put somebody under 50% or kill them instantly in the current state of Epic 7. Having somebody be at 30% or less means that you failed to kill or it's just like incidental chip damage, right? That That's kind of it. And every three turns, like, that's... I would give up the 30% combat readiness to have that happen, like, all the time. In fact, why did we have to give up the stealth in the first place at all? Like, I actually think that, overall, these are bad changes for Sez. Before, if he got focus fired, you could at least kind of, like, heal up or life steal out of this, you know, and go back up above 51% health and then re be able to reproc die hard until you're ready to set up your spez bomb. Or this at least gave you like some security to protect you until you could use your spez bomb. Now he is a sitting duck. Like you could just two tap this guy. Like we could come into a fight and literally two tap him. 
and there's just nothing he could do about it. And that's honestly tragic. And like the condition on encroach, like I said, it's just too hard to actually accomplish. I think that these are bad says changes. And I think if you're a says player, this is one of those times where unlike pirate captain flan, I would consider at least trying to get like, maybe not revert the whole thing, but at least try to fight for the stealth. I think that that should be something that they should have. Like says should be able to keep his stealth in this situation. I have no idea why it's being taken away. Speaking of bad changes, we have Elena. Exclusive Equipment 2, which used to dispel one additional buff when using Eternally Shining Comet from all allies, is being changed to dispel one debuff from all allies when using Consecrated Ground. That is her skill too, right? This effect applies before healing. That's fine. Elena is a staple of Anticleave for turn 2, and she is one of the best arena defense characters in the entire game. The reason why is because having exclusive equipment option number two on Eternally Shining Comet means that if the uh, attacker is going into your defense with New Moon Luna, they would try to seal and unbuffable your entire team. Cool. Now, when Elena takes her turn, she just Eternally Shining Comets, gets rid of the unbuffable, gets rid of the seal, and then puts the whole team in invincibility, and then your Luna Cleave basically fails. That's what made Elena so good as a defensive unit. Now, you get the debuff dispel when you are attacked by an AoE attack. Cool. So, the Luna seals you and unbuffles you. And then it becomes Elena's turn, and then she uses Eternally Shining Comet. It gets rid of unbuffable, but your entire team is still sealed. You see why that's a problem? <laughs> like, this is actually a bad change. I actually don't like this change at all. I would rather you put this exclusive equipment option number two on over a different exclusive equipment leave me with my one additional debuff from all eyes for eternally shining comet please and thank you right like we have one that gives cr push on s2 we have one that gives the one additional debuff from the s3 move this one the one you're proposing onto that third exclusive equipment right that is where i would put it because so far people only play one of those other two ones right they play the cr push versus cleave or they play the s3 cleanse to fight on arena defense. Nobody plays the first one as far as I'm aware. Move this new one to that one. Please and thank you. Next up we have the Great Mortalix. The character that I always say is the winner of the patch. And then it never ends up being true. Um, probably the character I've called wrong the most here on this channel. In uh, any sort of capacity. Personally I felt that Mort's base kit was pretty good. The problem is that he just has no damage. So, befitting the Great One, we decided to go for the most insane kit ever here, and let's just get into it. So now, Extermination ignores effect resistance of any targets with max health lower than the caster's max health, and the damage on Extermination was increased. So, cool, we got the damage increase we are looking for. And instead of having the Ignore ER when enraged, again, it's versus characters with less max HP than Pretty good when you consider Advent Mortalix has injury on it. That's nice. People sometimes like to play Mort on injury as well. Keep in mind that if he just naturally has higher max health, you will still ignore effect resistance. That said, that's a little bit difficult to do as Mort has, I believe, either the worst or the second worst max health for his stat line uh, amongst all the knights in Epic 7. This character is on a stat line that is very focused on attack percentage, despite being a health scaler. So... Do keep that in mind. I feel like a lot of players, if you're going to be on speed boots, you'll notice right away that it's pretty difficult to push into the 20,000 range with this character. You'll maybe get to like 23k, unless you have like absolute crack gear, or you're on HP percentage boots, right? Like the character doesn't really have a ton of health, surprisingly. So as good as that reads on Extermination, it's not as insane as you might originally think. That said, these other two skills, they're borderline batshit broken uh so absolute dignity still immune to debuffs which prevent movement that was stun and sleep that's just basically them cleaning up the language right all heroes except for mort cannot counter attack mort just out here straight up invalidating astromancer elena as a character so no one is allowed to counter but mort that's both yours and your opponents it's a symmetrical effect so, obviously, if you're going to be taking Mort, you're not going to be bringing any other counter attack characters. It's actually funny, just it, him having this on Absolute Dignity means Cleave will take him. Cleavers will try to cleave you with Mortalix, just because of that one change. 
Like, so, at worst, right? Like, at worst, Mort's at least a cleave anchor now, <laughs> which is kind of weird considering he's only been exclusively turned to up till this point. Uh, when an ally is attacked, he has a 20% chance to counterattack, and after counterattack, he has a 100% chance to use Sacred Blessing. Sacred Blessing can only be activated once every three turns. Sacred Blessing gave Mort a two turn speed buff, and also skill nullifier to all allies originally. I'm sorry, my bad. Critical hit resistance to all allies originally. It now gives skill nullifier, which is uh, a bit more consistent at preventing damage. It's like better and worse. It's kind of like a side grade. It's better up front, worse in the long run, right? So that's good. Built-in Elbrus, kind of insane as well. So that's also, yeah, wow. Um, but the big one here is on Advent Mortalix. Now, it, when you use it, right, it doesn't have the uh, the injury. So my bad before. I guess you'll have to find uh, a way to get injury otherwise. Yeah, just build this character as tanky as possible or build him with injury, right? Descends and attacks all enemies, inflicting fear for two turns before recovering health of the caster. Penetrates defense of the enemy with the highest max health by 70%, so that's going to do a ton of damage. And ignores ER of any targets that have max health lower than more, right? Cooldown was increased, but damage and healing were also increased. And in case you didn't see, Fear cannot act for a certain number of turns at the start of the turn. a 40% chance to be dispelled. So essentially, this is a two-turn stun with a 40% chance that you cleanse it at the start of your turn, right? And remember, it ignores effect resistance. So, Ambitious Tywin. Stun. Defense break. Ignores effect resistance. Highest win rate character at Worlds. Is a knight. Mort ignores effect resistance knight. Two turns stun. Like, why? Why would you do that? <laughs> like, Smogate, why? why? Why would you make another one of these? Like, this is actually, like, maddening. Um, so, needless to say, Mort is probably the winner of the patch. Um... This character seems very, very strong, like, for all playstyles, right? Built-in Elbrus, completely invalidating Astromancer Elena as a character. Can't be stunned or slept. Big damage now. Two-turn ignore ER stun. What's there to say? Like, he has finally gotten a set of buffs that hopefully makes him what his namesake is. The Great One. Exclusive equipment, by the way, here. They change it so uh, you get one extra uh, you know, turn of speed buff. This, honestly, was the, the EE I used on him originally. Three turns speed buff doesn't seem bad on a character like this, man. You'll get a lot of cycling. So, yeah. This one seems kind of nice. Next up, we got Yulha. Um, these set of changes, I'm not really sure how to feel about. I don't know how these actually help her kind of overtake Ambitious Tywin. Or, like, Albedo or Crimson Armin as, like, the premier tanks in the game. Instead of doing 30% damage that she was taken, uh, like if you deal single target damage to her, she would reflect 30% of that back at the attacker. Now it's 40% period, so if you AoE her incidentally, you will take some damage from Malicious Smile. The other thing that's really interesting here, Symphony of Agony comes off cooldown more often. That is her basically her crowd horse, her blue crowd horse. So that is also very, very good. But that said, I think that these changes probably help her more with Guild War. And less with like RTA. I think this might make her a decent option on Guild War Offense. I'm pretty sure she's actually pretty strong right now on Guild War Offense. So this will help you lean into that. But I don't think this really does a lot for World Arena. Blooming Lydica gets 50% defense penetration on her S3. That's cool. It helps kind of smooth over her edge cases, her consistency. Because there's been so many times where like a Blooming Lydica just doesn't kill. Because like you're missing one debuff here or there. The defense penetration hopefully helps out with that. One of the other big ones in this patch, Auxiliary Lots. They doubled the cooldown of Mana Injection from 2 turns to 4 turns. But gave it exploiting weak points, which is really nice. And then his S3 no longer is an AoE Silence. It is an AoE Defense Break. Now, for PvE, this is absolutely a nerf. And this is one of the things that people fought to revert months ago. The last time they tried to change Auxiliary Lots. They didn't beat around the bush here. The devs, they came out and said it. Auxiliary Lots is being adjusted to reduce its effectiveness in PvE while enhancing its performance in PvP. The combination of Augs Lots' short cooldown skill, mana injection, and the Spirit's Breath artifact has created situations where its efficiency in specific content became excessively high, making it difficult to control. Right, right? This is basically, if you read between the lines, this is the developers straight up telling you, 
This character is too hard to balance PvE content around. We are changing it in order to make it so that we can design better content for PvE going forward. He is becoming problematic in our testing when we are trying to make new content for our players. So, they basically are saying, hey, we need to nerf this character because it is making it hard for us to do our jobs. Sorry. As a result, you are going to be getting a recall for auxiliary lots if you would like it, right? So, I think it's good on them of being very transparent. This is how you don't make your player base angry. I liked the transparency. Please be more transparent with your player base. I think this is a super good thing. Obviously, all slots being worse at PvE is not a super good thing, but you know what I mean, right? Like, if it's impeding the ability to do the job, if it's causing issues, right, when they design new Hall of Trials or whatever content they might be working on, just be forthright and say, hey, like, we have to change this character. It just we can't make cool or interesting fights because this combination exists in the game. Sadly, we got to nerf it. Here's compensation. Like, thank you for understanding. So I'm okay with that. Next up, we have the changes to Peacemaker Furious. Character really needs damage, like overall. Uh, the consistency on the S1, I guess, is nice, but it doesn't really fix the key issue here, right? And then Set in Motion now no longer has Indomitable. It just has a straight defense buff, which is sure whatever it's like slightly better i think you could have just left him with indomitable honestly i would have just given him indomitable and defense buff because the changes here penetrates the target's defense by 60 percent i don't think that does anything black hole cannon already did like no damage right this character did no damage even if you had max pen this character just couldn't kill anything so just giving him the full pen without the conditional i don't think that changes anything like at all We'll see how this pans out, right? Maybe I'm wrong. We'll see uh, when the, the patch goes live next month. But damn, um, I don't think this changes anything. I don't think any of this changes anything on this character. All right, next one is Veronica. Before I get started on this, play the song. Okay, so now that we've got that going, um, one of the things about Veronica is that she is extremely good against Bloodblade Corinne, but is not able to be used by turn two and standard players, despite being free. It kinda sucks. So I've been talking for weeks how, when BBK came to prominence, I would really like it if Veronica had some way to be used as turn two. I was joking with like Valky, like standard Veronica, and he's like, that's not a thing. Like, I'm like, oh, we're, we're gonna do it. We're gonna have standard Veronica finally. Um, So vampire hunter here, right? Vampire killer, as I call it. Um. It now has it so that at the end of someone's turn, when an enemy is granted immortality, increases the combat readiness of Veronica by 20%. So she would basically just like rush to the front to try to be able to get rid of the immortality on the vampires, right? Or just characters like Bloodblade Corinne. So having the 50% combat readiness means that your Veronica, that's pretty much just going to always be in stealth, then is all effectiveness, right? You're not going to be able, I think, to get enough ER to resist like a full F Veronica. She can literally like turn one, book it to the front, right? Like right after whoever goes first, even if the, your opponent has first, right? She's in guiding light, she's safe from their zeal or whatever have you. You can literally book it to the front, stun the, the BBK with her S3, put her, re-put her into immortality with the bomb, and then immediately, because she will have the immortality again, book it back to the front after two turns because of Vampire Killer. So yes, Veronica is significantly better at doing the one thing that I need her to do, which is kill immortality characters. So I, I see this as an absolute win. Speaking of absolute wins, changes to Green Armin. I have said this on so many streams for like a year and a half, uh, videos like my account reviews. If you are a new player and you're struggling versus Klee, build yourself a Green Armin because she reduces the damage that is dealt by single target attacks to your team by 20%. They change that to 30%. You die in the Jacko and Sid Cleave, get yourself an Armin. Build her full damage, high as hell defense, Elbrus Ritual Sword. And if they proc the Elbrus, cool. You probably wipe their whole team or at least potentially stun them. But as long as that green Armin is sitting there big chilling, they are not killing anything with their skill threes. So this just further helps with the anti-cleave. I love to see this. Armin is a character I always have in my back pocket. I always have gear and I draft her a lot 
versus Cleave in World Arena. Now let's move on to the artifact balance changes as well as the system changes to wrap up the video. Cruel Mischief, they increase the damage on it. That's great. Skills artifact can only apply to one in a team. I guess that's because people were probably using a 27 and a 15 Cruel Mischief and the top teams, right, for Hall of Trials. This is to help level the playing field, make it a bit easier. The Augs Lock change probably also was with this one. Like, it was targeted specifically because of how people were abusing things for Hall of Trials to get that top 100 score. So, yeah, that's a good change, I feel like. Pure White Trust was basically just a bad version of Border Coin, and it needed to be something, anything other than that, right? So now we change it so that when you use a non-attack skill, you get 10 souls one time in a battle, and then have a 50 to 100% chance based on artifact level to give a critical hit damage buff to the caster for two turns. So, that's pretty damn good for Zahak players, right? Like, you just get to S2, get attack buff, and crit damage buff. You can just delete somebody, right? You can even soul burn off the rip. Uh, there's probably other characters out there that I'm not thinking of that could take advantage of this. Like, my brain was literally like, Zahak and Red Sarmia, let's go, baby. But there's almost assuredly somebody that could use this. Lionheart actually might be able to use this. You proc uh, your passive, right? It's far from over. You get 10 souls. You get a crit damage buff. That seems pretty decent. I don't know if I would give up... Uh, like proof of valor or like uh golden rose on the death or lifesteal builds but if you're on, like the speed cleave build you could be cooking with something i actually think this is a pretty good change overall it gives uh the fact that it's making me brainstorm about possibilities means it's a good change because before i was never even considering pure white trust at any point for anything ever rnl gets 10 percent attack boo boo <laughs> yeah obviously this is only really played on like Era or like ran this basically just makes the ran never never loses the r and l right combo just better kind of we'll get to the battle system adjustments in a second so yeah um good for ran as if ran needed it because he's already one of the best heroes in the game for everybody else yeah sure whatever uh and then we have a change here to hostess of the banquet to make it be about two percent more damage overall and more consistent because before it was only when the targets at high health and then you didn't really get anything now you're going to get some damage no matter what hostess has obviously been a very good artifact i have a lot of people come through for fix it fridays who don't have the artifact gala is coming up next week after the as of the recording of this video get yourself a hostess of the banquet is a very good limited artifact to have for your thieves finally we have battle system adjustments here right all right let me just read their words so you kind of can get a, a grasp here. Currently, the battle system in E7 operates on a mechanism where if the additional turn effect occurs more than once in a single turn due to certain artifacts, all effects are stored and granted as stacked additional turns. While there are probability variables involved, this can sometimes lead to situations where the battle is excessively influenced, potentially causing frustration during battles. Therefore, we plan to revise the battle rules to prevent additional turns from being stacked. Previously, how this worked, in case you don't understand, we would use S2 on RAN, proc RNL, press S3, proc RNL. Then you would have two turns of RNL store, and then you could just go S1, S1. Hence the 2 3 one, one meme, right? The RAN never loses meta, RNL. Three, uh, you've probably seen that if you've ever been in Twitch chat. 2 3 one, one, you press RAN skill 2, you press this 3, and then you get two bonus 1s at the end. That would literally win games on the spot. Hence, Ran never loses, because it could just happen anytime Ran had a turn. The fact that they've made this change is pretty monumental. This is basically a low-key nerf to Ran without actually nerfing Ran. So now, basically, the best you can hope for is 2-3-1. There is no second one. That is a pretty good change, in my opinion, because, like they said, it would excessively influence uh, battles, right? I'm pretty sure we saw 2-3-1-1 on the world stage in like some of the qualifiers at some point. I'm sure like big profile games like for, you know, any of the, the world qualifiers are like, you know, on ladder, right? There's definitely been matches that have been decided that are very important throughout the course of E7's history because they just procced double RNL. So being only able to proc one RNL, I think makes things a bit more fair and honestly i'm okay with that so yeah that's it for the october 24th balance adjustment preview personally i think this is one of the best balance patches that we've ever gotten but 
This is where I want to hear from you. Let me know down in the comments below. Do you really like this balance patch? Do you hate it? What would you have liked to see change? Do you not like some of my opinions on stuff? All that. Would love to hear any and all comments down below. And as always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week, and I'll catch you in the next one. Later now.